All right, so let's do some proofs, and we'll take um, we'll be proving an implication. We'll take the one that we did last in the last video, and we'll talk about first though trivial and vacuous proofs before I do an actual direct proof. All right, what about trivial and vacuous proof? These first two. If I look at any implication. And its truth table. If I have left implies a square implies triangle, these are either true or false. True or false. And so if you would look at an implication, if it if it ended up being that what you were talking about implies what you're talking about, you would get it true. If what you're talking about implies false, that would be false, and false implies anything is true. What happens is if you would look at just the bottom two rows. If I only look at the bottom two rows, I notice that if my hypothesis is simply false, then the entire implication must be true. And taking those two rows alone allows to this idea of what we call a vacuous proof. And a vacuous proof is to simply that if you can simply show that the left-hand side of your implication is false, you're done. Done. We have it being vacuously true. Right? So it doesn't matter. It's those two lines right there. If you look, because this never happens, the first two rows are gone. And so since the left is false, it doesn't matter, right? It's just going to be vacuously true. It's it's sometimes like silly arguments in what we're talking about, but in the end, if you can actually show that, you know, we're good to go, right? It's you're going to show that the entire implication is is true. The other one focuses on the fact that you know what, if the second thing that you're talking about is true, it ends up being that the entire statement is true, right? So. What that allows is, irregardless, it doesn't matter. I don't care what the hypothesis is. If the conclusion is true, then the entire thing is also true. That means that the second and third row have not happened. That's called a trivial proof. So the idea of a trivial proof is if you can show that the right-hand side of your implication is true, irregardless, it's like you don't care about the, the left. You're only, just ignore the left. If you just notice that the right-hand side is just always true, we're done. This is trivially true. It's when these don't happen that we get to something interesting. And now we move on to the next technique, which is called a direct proof. All right, what's the idea behind a direct proof? The idea behind a direct proof is, you know what? I don't really care if the first part is false. If the per first part is false, there wasn't anything for me to do. What matters is, hey, the, I, the first part's true, right? I'm gonna assume that the first part's true and then, boy, this must happen, and this better not. <laughs> if the second part is true, then this entire second row is gone, and all we have is true implies true is true, and the second part is right. And if the first part was false, who cares? That would have been true vacuously. So the idea here is you take, you know, for an implication, you just simply assume that the left is True. Well, can we do that? Yes, you can. Why? What's a valid form of reasoning? You assume the hypothesis, right? What's a fallacy? You assume the conclusion. You can't assume the right, right? That's that's a fallacy. You can assume the left. That is valid forms of reasoning. So let's assume the right. So I assume that the right-hand side is true. In other words, what we're doing is we assume we're on the first two rows, possibly. And then after you do that, show that the right-hand side must be true from that fact, which is from that assumption.
So let's go to my example. So n1 is odd and n2 is odd implies n1 plus n2 is even. So that's my conjecture. Here's my proof. I'm going to assume the left. n1 is indeed odd and n2 is indeed odd. And hopefully I can show that the right hand side works. Now this is also important about what you bring to bear. When you read something you have to know what in the world it's talking about, right? So when I say things like odd, what does it mean to be odd? I know the odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, but what does that mean mathematically? If I say even, you know, two, four, six, eight, what does that mean mathematically? Uh, even would, another word for even would be that it has a factor of two. An odd would be it's one off of a factor of two, right? Because five is odd because it's two times two plus one, right? It's one off of a factor of two. So we have to know what you're talking about. The other is you have to know what you bring to bear. I see things like plus, I better know arithmetic, I better know algebra, I better know calculus. I can bring those tools to use in this proof. And so what does it mean to assume n is odd? Well, that just simply is the same as, right? This would just go through here and say, okay, what does that mean? Well, n1 is odd is logically the same thing. What it really means is n1 is equal to twice an integer plus one, right? Where i is some integer. I don't know what it is, but I know it's one off of a multiple of two. And n2 is twice some integer. I'll pick some other integer where j is some integer, right? It's one off of a multiple of two. So that's what those two things mean. These are this, these two things are literally logically to be one off of a multiple of two. So I just replace them with what they're, they're equal to. And then we'll ask, well, you have to keep in mind where we're going. I want to show that their addition is an even number. Well, what is their addition? Well, that implies that n1 plus n2, I can replace things with their equal. That allows me to do that in algebra. So that's 2i plus 1 plus 2j plus 1. I know how to add that. That is 2i plus 2j plus 2. And now we stop and ask, okay, what's the point? <laughs> what am I doing? I would like this to be the point is an even number. And I look at that. Well, is that even? What is an even? An even is twice an int. Well, look at this. i is an int, j is an int, 1 is an int, add an int. I get an int because I know the closure properties of int. Well, I, I could assume that. So this is twice an integer. Twice an integer is twice an integer is even. So n1 plus n2 is even. So what happened? I assumed that n1 is odd and n2 is odd and showed that if that's true n1 plus n2 is even so I have done what I wanted to do. I've proved it. So this is a direct proof. The idea of a direct proof is you assume the left and then take everything that you know from your background in mathematics to bear to show that the right hand side must logically follow. Right? We're going to use rules of inference, logical equivalencies, restating things, algebra, calculus, trigonometry, things that we know, definitions of what it means to be equal, right? until what is an odd, and other different aspects of it. So this is one of the proofs. I'll state right now here at the end, um, uh, the question for uh, attendance will be just simply, I'll ask you, did you watch this? But what I want you to study is I'm going to have everybody, and this is important, is um, note, prove square root of 2 is irrational, is going to be on the exam, right? So that is definitely going to be on the exam. And what's going to happen here for this is you're going to have to figure out, I'd like you to, it's, it's a proof in the book, it's a proof I'll do next class. 
uh, in the next lectures. But you're gonna have to. I'd like you to over this weekend read up on what in the world the world irrational is. Study up what the square root of two is. These are proofs are going to be detailed enough that you cannot memorize them. You have to understand them. So. Just like all of this, we are refining how you think, and we're going to build out, eventually we get into number theory and other aspects, we build out knowledge based upon old knowledge. All right, that's it.